I want to welcome you to the Art of Communicating Climate, featuring Catherine Hayhoe and conversation with Mika Tuska. Um, this event is moderated by Christine Esposito and is the second program for our Third Coast Disrupted Artists and Scientists on Climate. Many of you may have joined us last night for Catherine's amazing talk. Recordings of both last night and today's talks will be available uh, on our website and ar around the interweb um, in the coming weeks. Third Coast Disrupted is an exhibition of newly commissioned artworks culminating from a year-long conversation between seven artists and seven scientists centered on climate change, its impacts, and solutions in the Chicago region. Based on the notion that art can connect and engage with people on an emotional level, Third Coast Disrupted is intended to pique curiosity, be unexpected, tactile, and memorable. The show aims to inspire visitors and reflect, to reflect and talk to each other and act. Um, it's a feat to put together an exhibition of newly commissioned works and then add to it facilitating a discussion among 14 scientists and artists that both acknowledge the re very real effects of climate change while focusing on solution oriented ideas. For this, we have needed a village. This program was created through a collaboration between Columbia College Chicago, DePaul University's Institute for Nature and Culture, and Terracom. We also couldn't have done this without our sponsors and supporters, especially with the support of the Illinois Arts Council Agency and the Illinois Science and Energy Innovation Foundation. We invite you to join us in person at the exhibition, which is currently on view at the Glass Curtain Gallery in Chicago, through October 30th, or come visit us online at thirdcoastdisrupted.org and column.edu slash thirdcoast, where you can learn more about the artists and the scientists involved, as well as see future programs. Now, I would like to introduce Christine Esposito, the project director and lead curator of Third Coast Disrupted. She is also the founder of Terracom, a 30-year-old environmental communications firm whose ex exchange project brings together collaborators to create art and science initiatives like Third Coast Disrupted. Thank you, Meg. Thank you everyone, as Meg said, for joining us so early this morning. And thank you to our sponsor, Open Lands, for helping to make this event possible. We're so excited to have Dr. Keho and Dr. Tosca with us to talk about the art of communicating climate. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Catherine Hayhoe is an atmospheric scientist whose research focuses on understanding what climate change means for people and the places where we live. She is an endowed professor at Texas Tech University. She hosts the PBS digital series Global Weirding, and she has been named one of Time's 100 Most Influential People, United Nations Champion of the Environment, and the World Evangelical Alliance's Climate Ambassador. Mika Tosca is a climate scientist, a humanist, and activist. She is an assistant professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and an affiliate climate researcher at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. Her research explores the intersection of human activities and climate change and has taken her to Africa and back. Mika is an out and proud transgender scientist using the pronouns she and her. So let's get started. Catherine mentioned some research last night that we're, we will um, folk, uh, start with this morning as well. And that is some research by the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication, Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, that mm -hmm. found that 60 to 70 percent of people in the Chicago region, varying by county, rarely or never mention or discuss global warming and climate change. At the same time, climate scientists, like Catherine especially, say that the most important climate action is talking about climate change. So we've got some work to do. Catherine, I'm going to start with you. You advise people starting climate conversations to bond with others on shared values and concerns and to always work in practical solutions. Please tell us how you arrived at that and about your most memorable experience with that approach. 
So often when we hear people objecting to climate change, they use what I think of as sciencey sounding objections. Like it's just a natural cycle or it was cold outside or don't you know that climate has always changed. But if we continue the conversation for any more than maybe 30 to 60 seconds, their objections will pivot 90 degrees to, I don't want the EPA in charge. I don't want the government to take away my truck. I don't want to destroy the economy. How are we gonna get electricity when the wind doesn't blow at night? 99.9% .9 of our real objections are solution aversion. We don't understand that there are ways we can still get our energy safely in the future with cleaner air, cleaner water, and an even more healthy economy than we have today because we're used to the way it's been, not just for the last 10 or 20 years, but for the last 300 years. So no wonder we're a little bit nervous about it, but that just shows that although we have to address those sciencey myths and our Global Weirding series does that on YouTube, we also need to talk about why there is a different way to live because that's what truly overcomes people's objections. And I would say I've had so many different talks about this. Probably one of the ones I remember the most is when I was giving a talk at a local junior college here in Texas. And I had talked to the students about how we know Climate is changing and humans are responsible. It's not the sun, it's not volcanoes, it's not natural cycles. It's affecting us here in Texas and that's very important as we talked about last night, bringing it down to the local scale and talking about how it's affecting us where we live. And then I talked about positive solutions like here in Texas, we have so much wind and so much sun, we could power the entire country with a 100 by 100 square mile area in West Texas. So afterwards, one of the instructors, not the one who had invited me, followed me out to the car and he said, you didn't talk about how it's the sun. Everybody knows it's the sun. And I said, well, actually I did talk about that for a few minutes and we know it's not the sun because the sun's energy is going down. And without even taking a breath, he said, but the EPA doesn't want me to burn wood in my stove. So literally like the neurons that say climate change isn't real are right next to the neurons that say we can't fix it. And that's the real reason we object. And so we have to address that reason. How do you find your way to connecting with people over shared values in that context? Um, well, it depends on the person. And if you don't know what the person's values are, rather than assuming you know what they are, the best thing to do is talk to them and get to know them and find that out. So there's no one size fits all because different people care about different things. So just to give you an example, I was talking to a, a farmer um, here in West Texas a while ago, and he was a little suspicious of this climate scientist, but I was at Texas Tech University, which was the local university, and uh, it turns out he knew somebody who went to the church that I went to, and I knew somebody who went to the church he went to, so you know, two degrees of separation, and so at that point, I felt comfortable enough to ask him a question. I said, I notice that your neighbor has wind turbines up to the edge of your land, but you don't have any. You have a couple of oil wells, but no wind turbines. Is there a reason for that? So I didn't, I didn't assume that he didn't want them. I just asked why. And his answer taught me a lot. It taught me not to assume because I was going to assume he'd be like, oh, those wind turbines, nobody likes them. No, he said, yes, there is a reason. So a little bit nervously, I said, why? And he said, I've been on the list two years waiting for my wind turbines. My neighbor got on the list before me and he's been getting the check in the mail every month. <laughs> and he said, and those oil people, they drive in and off my land all the time, messing up my fields. But those wind turbines, they just set them up and they push the button from Florida. And like I said, the check arrives in the mail. So that was a great lesson for me, not to make any assumptions and to recognize that people have different reasons for wanting solutions and that's okay, right? Because if we're all for, for example, clean energy or efficiency or sustainable living, it doesn't matter why we're for it. We don't all have to be doing it for the same reason. The fact that we're all for the solution is what really matters. I think what I heard you saying too is, uh, we, it's best that we don't make any assumptions. We need to ask questions, but we also need to listen because we might be surprised by what we hear. Uh, that was a great example. Mika you took a different route to starting conversations about climate change, uh, teaching art students about climate change. Tell us about your decision to leave the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to go to an art school and about your most 
exciting and encouraging outcome with that move. Sure, thank you. I, I, it's different, but I don't think my um, discussion is all that different from, from what Dr. Hayho was talking about. Um, in that uh, sort of meeting people where they are and finding uh, commonality to inspire people is really gonna, gonna be the path forward with, with climate change. And so coming at it from someone who's a scientist who teaches at an art school, um, <clears throat> I have sort of in that process also learned to open up my own imagination. And I always tell my students, we live in an opportunity to be truly revolutionary with respect to climate change. Um, all we need to do is imagine a future. Um, and who better to imagine, help us imagine a future than artists and creative people. Um, I think sometimes scientists um, fail a little bit in our effort to sort of reach people um, where, the, where they're sort of most visceral, most emotional. And I think art and creative creativity and design and, and people who make things um, do have that ability. And so I've really been focusing on that for the past um, couple of years since I came to, to, to SAIC in 2017, um, partly as a result of uh, the election in 2016 and partly as, a, as sort of just a feeling like I, I really needed to do something uh, different than sit at a desk at JPL. So, um, so this is all still kind of a, a, a relatively new effort. The first project that I, that I worked on um, was with a designer uh, from JPL and we, um, we took this stodgy data set that I had compiled during my time at JPL on wildfires across the world and the, the height of smoke from those, from those wildfires. I love that. Um, Can I just say I love that word? Is there any data set that isn't stodgy? <laughs> That's I mean, cool. truly. And that really is like the problem, right? So like, uh -huh. it was, is this, I think, a beautiful data set that we helped compile. But um, the, the, the way in which you could access it was like basically unusable, except for for me, who who <laughs> who built the data set, and so we uh, we wrote a grant and we we worked with some design with a design team and a, and a computer software engineer, um, and it was actually it started as an internship um, program, and then it kind of burgeoned into this like uh, larger project. Um, and so what we did is we took um, the 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 website which we were delivering the data from, and we essentially scrapped the whole thing um, and then and kind of redid it. Um, and the functionality of the new website is really astounding. I can share my screen for, if I can share my screen for just a second. So I've got it opened up here. Um, so the, the, the new sort of way in which we designed the website, we called it Merlin, um, which is just like NASA people love to put an acronym on everything. Um, and so you can see Adrian was really instrumental in this, in redesigning the website. So it's very user friendly now, right? You can immediately see when you open it, all of the fire plumes, where all the fires are burning across the US, uh, or sorry, across the world, and you can filter it by various um, values. And, and so what this did is this really informed um, scientists right from the get go, like, are these data worth downloading? Is this question worth exploring? And so we're still thinking about um, ways in which this not only has been a better um, sort of way of communicating and, and delivering these data, but also facilitating the production of better science. And so I always maintain as a scientist who, who kind of works with artists, that artists can not only help us communicate climate change better, which of course they can, uh, right? But they can also help us do science better. Um, and I think that this is like, one really, really good example. Um, I also have a few things just that I love that my students have made. So as part of all of my courses for their final exam, instead of an exam, I give them a project um, where they can kind of imagine a climate uh, or an environmental crisis and uh, think about sort of a way in which to present it creatively rather than sort of write a research paper on it. And so I have a few with me, um, which are normally in my office, and I, I braved the, uh, I went downtown yesterday for the first time since April, um, so that was interesting. And this one is my favorite. So um, I teach a class called Environmental Disasters, um, and uh, one of the environmental disasters that we talk about is the um, emerald ash borer, um, which is a, a bug that sort of... Um, infected a lot of ash trees across the Midwest and is causing like a lot of death uh, among ash trees, especially here in, in the Midwest. And so he is a furniture maker 
Um, and so he kind of made sort of a, an abstract emerald ash borer beetle <laughs> um, out of ash wood that was discarded because it was infected with the emerald ash borer. Um, so I really love how it sort of is this kitschy little fun thing that also really communicates, um, you know, a lot of information and sort of a, a really like fun and piece to interact with. Another one of my students made um, a zine, which is still my favorite and I have it on my coffee table, which is called Mosquitoes Are Gonna Make Things Suck More and it's kind of because global warming is just generally terrible. Um, and it's a, it's a collection of sort of um, writing and drawing um, and I, it's just, I think a zine like this is a really wonderful way um, of kind of communicating complicated concepts in a way that a lot of more people can connect with. Um, I have so many examples, which maybe I'll pull out in the next um, couple of, in the next hour, but I'll stop for now. <laughs> <laughs> Those are wonderful examples and uh, they cover so many, there are so many things to pull out of that. One of them is the idea of whimsy uh, with that EAB emerald ash borer pest that your student created. And I'm thinking about Third Coast Disrupted, our exhibition that's on view right now. We have, um, I'm thinking about one of the artworks that is about a very grim topic, people who uh, died in, that, in the 95 heat wave in Chicago. But he also, while also focusing on solutions in it, he also brought in some elements of whimsy. So there's, there's so much, there's such a place for that. But I also wanna go back to, Mika, you were talking about your, um, your website and the data. Um, Catherine, and I wanna, I wanna just think about data for a bit. What role does data play? Uh, what you did, Mika, was, was, was largely for scientists, if I understand it correctly. And uh, Catherine, I want to ask you what role data plays in conversations with people who aren't scientists? Hmm. Uh, data in this information age is often our weapon of choice when we are arguing with each other. So if somebody doesn't agree with us, we go out on the internet and we find something that shows that we are right. We're not looking for, you know, objective data source. We're looking for whatever shows that we are right. And we come back with that to hit them upside the head with. And so in climate change, often we get hung up on arguing with each other over that data, over that fact, those factoids, so to speak. And I've been reading a really interesting book called Being Ecological by a Philosopher called Timothy Morton. And in it, he argues that our obsession with factoids is like a kind of a uncomfortableness with this modernity, modernity era that we live in, that we're still kind of arguing over the number of angels on the head of a pin when in fact, human civilization is facing the biggest challenge that it ever has. So whenever somebody starts to want to argue about data, that's usually a sign that that's like a smoke screen to cover something else that has a lot more to do with what's in our hearts than what's in our heads. And so that's why it's so important to, as I talked about last night, and also as I talk about in my TED Talk, which I posted in the chat here if anybody wants a link to it, it's so important to connect over um, things that we care about, over our emotions, over how we feel about things, and then talk about what to do. Because when we say, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but we have some questions already popping up on the list. When we basically say to somebody else, you should be doing this. What we're doing is, first of all, we're implicitly judging them, number one, and that's very clear. <laughs> Whenever anybody unsolicited tells you you should be doing this, who is not your parent, um, it does not really come across well. Um, you should be doing this and uh, you're also giving them just one more thing on their already massive to-do list. And these days, everybody's doing the best that they can. It might not look that great from the outside, but everybody is at their absolute maximum in whatever situation they're in. And there are all kinds of emotions associated with that. And so 
I know when somebody says to me, you really have to do this, I just feel like, oh my gosh, it's already a dumpster fire. Just toss one more thing on the file. It's not like I'm going to get to it anyways. So you can see how that isn't really a constructive way to have these conversations about climate change. Instead, talking about how we feel about things first, even how we feel about our lives, how discouraged we feel. And then from there, transitioning to something that we could do that's positive, that actually makes us feel like our lives are better. And so the example was, you know, how do we get people to change their diets? Because um, at a global level, the problem of climate change is caused by burning fossil fuels. 75% of the problem is fossil fuels, 25% is deforestation and animal agriculture. In total, 14% is animal agriculture. But individually and personally, often if we eat a lot of meat, then for us personally, that can be a big part of our carbon footprint. So the question was, how do you get somebody to eat less meat? Well, the thing is there, the, the way you ask the question is part of the problem because you feel like there's something that they should be doing that they're not. But what if there's somebody who's struggling financially? What if they would be interested in some recipes that use some ingredients that don't cost as much as expensive meat? What if there's somebody who's actually worried about their health and a more healthy diet? What if they're worried about feeding their kids and they just wanna make sure their kids get enough protein and they don't know how to do that? So what if there's other things that they're worried about and you could actually address that in the conversation through getting to know them and through asking questions and through not judging and assuming they don't want to do the right thing first. Wow. Yes. Connecting, connecting, connecting. Hmm. Mika, uh, did you um, have any thoughts about the data and communications with non-scientists? Yeah, so in thinking about what Catherine was just saying, um, she mentioned Timothy Morton, which is funny because I was also going to bring up Timothy Morton, but his other book, Hyper Objects, um, or it's a long essay, um, because I think this also gets at this, right? So um, part of the problem is that he, he defines climate change as a hyper object, and I sort of can see that uh, perspective. I think it's, it's, it's an object. Uh, we, we can perceive it. We know it's, it's real, but we actually can't, we don't know exactly what it, what it is. Um, if you ask someone to explain climate change, it's, you know, what is it, right? It's all of these things. Um, and so it's a hyper object. It's larger than life almost. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, um, to conceptualize it. And I think data don't help that. Uh, there are, there are, there are, there's a lot of data out there. Um, <laughs> It can be intimidating. It can be it can be difficult to to kind of uh, to access for sort of a non scientist uh, person who's who's got an, a million other things going on in their life. They don't really have time to think about these data, and so it is easy to to um, to use data both to your advantage and and as a weapon, um, which we know that the the sort of anti um, climate change crowd uh, solutions crowd um, employs often. Um, but tying data in uh, with art, so I think a lot of times people think about data as being this sort of purely scientific thing, but actually artists engage with data um, a lot. I know there's a lot of artists who are listening right now and you're nodding your heads. I know I have to say that out loud because a lot of scientists don't realize that. Um, and so a really great example, uh, so, so, so I guess my point is like data isn't on its face inaccessible. I think sometimes it's just how we think about data and how we use data can make it kind of inaccessible for a lot of people. And so I had a student um, who I worked with uh, last year and unfortunately we, we had like grant plans and then the pandemic sort of got in the way. So we're still trying to figure out what to do, but um, he created um, uh, kind of a, <laughs> a remix of Jimi Hendrix um, singing and playing the, the Star Spangled Banner, the national anthem at Woodstock. Um, and on top of it, he superimposed a sine curve of all of the sounds in the song that increased in frequency relative to the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it's really cool. Um, it, by the end, it becomes really like dysphonic and almost like uh, dystopic sounding. Um, and so I think that was kind of the, the point. Um, and so that is a way of, of, of bringing data to the average person being like, oh, I understand this. Actually, this makes a lot of sense to me. Everything just got more chaotic, the more sort of carbon dioxide you introduced into this, like, um, into this, into this rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. So that's, you know, what, like one way we can, we can use our imaginations and we can reimagine these futures um, using sort of and harnessing the creative power of like artists and makers. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the, the data visualization is in a way 
short circuiting thinking. It, 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 it enables you to process that information in a different way. And, and because this is a program related to Third Coast Disrupted, I'm going to give another quick example in our exhibition. It is an artwork that is a vis visualization of, well, it actually entails a million dots on the wall in the gallery because it is, it wants to show the relationship, the, the power of this relatively small amount of carbon dioxide in our air, 415, 415 parts per million, relative to the million, a million air molecules. And when you see it, you don't have to think. You see, you see just these 415 little dots that are wreaking such havoc. Uh, it, it, you don't have to think. You just see it and you get it. I want to ask you both about, you know, we're talking about interdisciplinary situations here a, a lot. Mika, that's what you're describing. Um, and Catherine, last night, you talked about, you mentioned work of a, a sociologist, I, I thought a neuroscientist, but certainly a psychologist. Um, are there other disciplines that we should be bringing into this contemplation about communicating about climate that, that haven't been tapped yet? And uh, Catherine, we'll start with you. Well, my answer to that is absolutely yes. And in fact, at our university, at Texas Tech University, we have a climate center which used to be called the Climate Science Center. And we decided to remove the word science from it because we wanted people from every department and every college and every school at the university to feel as if they could be part of it because they all have something to contribute. So we have over 50 faculty affiliates and they come from every college and school, including law, business, architecture, medicine, engineering, arts and sciences, and agriculture and natural resources. So just to give you an example, we have someone from the English department who studies narrative and rhetoric. He studies the stories, the cultural stories that we use to frame our role in the world. Like the fact that farmers use the story of David and Goliath when they're fighting over water rights with the government. And of course, you know, the government being Goliath and them being David. But the, what, what, what the government, so to speak, which is just made up of people, is trying to do is to make sure that the aquifer doesn't run out on us um, through overuse, through some people using more than their fair share. Um, then we have, um, we have artists who are part of, of our climate center. We have engineers who actually do the modeling of the aquifers to show how much there is left. Um, we have people who study media and communication. So how do people respond to everything from the Pope's encyclical to messaging about how much water we have left in our aquifer and what's left, when, you know, when it goes. Um, bringing everybody together is so essential because climate change is the most multifaceted issue that affects every aspect of our psychology, our physiology, our economy, our society, our civilization, and the natural world. And I think we've already touched on this because both Mika and I have cited the works of a philosopher, for example, who you don't normally think of, you know, a philosopher when you're talking about climate change. And the very first link I posted in the chat was to the work of social scientists who survey public opinion on climate change so we understand what people really think about it. So there are so many people and every person and every discipline is unique. And so they bring a unique perspective to the table. And again, it's as if, to use the overused metaphor, it's as if we have an elephant and scientists have been studying the skeleton of the elephant for centuries. So scientists are really good at the skeleton of the elephant, but the skeleton is inside the elephant. So nobody actually sees it except the scientists with their x-ray machines, right? That's kind of what you're getting at with our data being so, so obtuse. Instead, we need people who paint the elephant. We need people who study the elephant's behavior. We need people who understand every part of the elephant and its, its health and how it's doing it, how it interacts with its environment and the environment it must live in. We need everybody on board. And so when students ask me, what should I study? My number one piece of advice is study whatever you love, whatever you are passionate about, whatever you enjoy that you're talented about, uh, in, and then apply whatever that is to climate change because whoever you are and whatever you're good at and whatever you're interested in, we need you doing that. 
Yeah, can I add something to that really Please. quick? I, th I think um, that resonates so much with me because I teach science to art students. At the end of the day, all this cool stuff that I'm doing with art and science, at the end of the day, I still am a professor. I teach, I teach science to art kids, so I've got to meet them where they, where they are, where they want to be. Um, and so, you know, I try and I, I started by sort of uh, their readings were, were like really scientific texts or like texts that I thought were really important for, for understanding climate change and whatever. Um, and uh, now I've, <laughs> I basically, I assign books by anthropologists and historians and, um, you know, philosophers. And I, I, you know, I have a really good friend who, who's um, earning a PhD at U Chicago um, in like environmental history, histories and American histories. And so uh, he recommends a lot of stuff that I never would have been exposed to if I had just stuck as a scientist, you know, working at JPL. And so I think that this is like so important for us to understand how, um, you know, intersectional really, um, interdisciplinary really, the solutions to the climate crisis actually need to be. And that actually reminds me, um, I've been posting links here in the chat. So anybody who's listening, if you haven't been following the chat, your questions don't go in the chat. Your questions go on pollev.com slash Catherine. We've already got a bunch of questions there with a bunch of updates. The link to that is in the chat. But we've also been posting links um, to, I was posting links to everything I could that I found for you, that you were referencing, Mika. And I just posted a link to a reading list that I've been compiling on Amazon that is aiming for the, that exact type of interdisciplinarity that you're talking about. All kinds of different perspectives on climate science, climate solutions, climate impacts, how to talk about climate, how to think about about climate, why we don't think about climate um, as diverse as possible. Mm -mm -mm. Um, well, I want to change gears a little bit. We, we will take questions. What will we, we take questions at 845? Does that sound good to folks? Um, We've got a lot of them, so we might want to start out a little bit earlier because there's quite right. a few. <laughs> how, how about if I ask you one more question, ask two, you, two of you one more question, and then uh, we'll take more questions. I want to know what has surprised you most in your efforts at communicating about climate change. Uh, let's start with the you, Catherine. I was going to say start with Mika. I want to know. <laughs> we can start with Mika. You yeah. want to go, Mika? Oh, sure. I, um, <laughs> well, at the, what has surprised me the most about this sort of like direction that my career has has taken, I'll start with that because I think that informs my answer. But um, in in a, at risk of offending all of the artists who are listening, I'm a scientist, and um, for a long time, I you know I honestly I didn't think artists were uh, this kind of academically engaged, let's say, as they actually as they are. So, uh, artists do a lot of research um, in the production of their of their artwork or, 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 or their, their performances. Um, and I don't think that that research is actually all that different uh, from the research that scientists do. And so I have a little sort of uh, bit that I, that I include in all of my talks and, and I'm in the process of writing up a, a manuscript on this, although finding a journal in which to publish it is, is proving complicated. Um, <laughs> but I think about ways in which the art making and specifically the design process um, is similar and yet different from the quote-unquote scientific method. So with the caveat that the scientific method is not a real linear thing, it's more circular, right? But you kind of, at the end of the day, can think of the scientific method as sort of like um, investigating some data, coming up with a hypothesis, doing some more analysis, and then you have some sort of conclusion, right? There's a lot of circularity and, and loops in there. The design process is very similar, except it starts with um, human engagement. So designers and, and artists will, will, will talk to people, think about who's actually gonna be using the products that they're going to be designing, what, they want, what those people want out of those um, products, and then they go and you know, uh, work on like prototyping and there are back and forth iterations, much like the this, this sort of scientific method when we're doing research and analysis. And then there's some sort of artifact that's produced during the design process. And the main difference between the two is that the design process relies heavily on this initial human engagement step and then human engagement throughout the process. And I think sometimes as a scientist, um, we think that our question that we're asking is the best question and the only question and the most important question. And sometimes um, 
we, we could use, I think, a little bit more engagement with actually people who we're trying to reach, right? And I'm not discounting the fact that we should, we should still be doing what I call basic science, which is sort of investigating things at whimsy uh, that are where our curiosity takes us. But with the climate crisis and as a scientist who's kind of engaged in trying to get people on board to solutions 10 years ago, um, <laughs> which is when we needed them, right? So as someone who does that, um, I'm thinking about ways in which science can engage better. And I think we can draw on this design and, and, and artistic making process in ways that we haven't before. And so I'm still kind of exploring how we talk about that with scientists who, I've given talks like this and I think a lot of scientists are into it and then sometimes scientists push back a little. So there's, there's, it's, it's been a, a it, I think that's probably the most surprising thing that I've encountered. It's, hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I would say, yeah, I can see how someone pushed back. It's not, it's not for everybody, but you're right. And uh, interestingly, that's something that didn't surprise me at all because my sister is an artist. Um, and she also edits a Chinese engineering journal because she has a degree in chemistry as well and technical yeah. editing. So uh, my sister and I have had conversations for years about what she's painting and what she's thinking, what she's painting it. And um, she has a few series on ice that she's done um, looking specifically at the interaction between melting ice and the environment. But I completely agree with you. And last night I showed the work of Jill Pelto, who is the daughter of a um, uh, glaciologist, somebody who studies glaciers. So her dad, Maury Pelto, studies the melting glaciers. And Jill grew up not only going out to the field with him, but also looking at all the data sets he uses. And she ended up turning the data sets into artwork. So, and you've probably seen those. I'll post a link here in the chat. We're posting links to everything we talk about here in the chat. And again, if you have questions, make sure to post those on the link to pollev.com. Um, but she, uh, she was actually on the cover of Time Magazine a couple of weeks ago um, with one of her data sets when they had a special issue about climate change. So um, I would say what surprised me the most in, my, in all the conversations and the journey that I've had over the last 10 years is what I alluded to earlier, which is the fact that so often we prejudge people. So we just assume that if you look a certain way, if you speak a certain way, if you live in a certain place, if you vote a certain way, that you just have this entire package of values that are either consistent with mine or completely antithetical to mine. And if I think, if I get any clue that they're antithetical to mine, we often just kind of cut things off right there. But through being embedded in a culture that's very different to mine, growing up in Canada, moving to Texas is, is, is much more different than moving to many other countries in the world. Um, being embedded in a very different culture and getting to know people and getting past that kind of superficial layer to who people really are underneath has shown that not always, but nearly always, we actually have more in common than we think. And if we get past our opinions to why we think have those opinions, we might actually agree on the feelings or the concerns or the worries or the values or the loves or the hates that underlie those opinions, even though they may have drawn us to different conclusions. And so it's really surprised me how many people, when you actually get down to it, really do already care about climate change. They just haven't realized it. And I always thought you have to make people care about climate change, but it turns out, and I even wrote an essay about this, I'll put a link in the chat, it turns out that they already do, but they just don't know it or aren't conscious of it or can't articulate it yet. Or you haven't even put the pieces together in their own mind, but the values and the concern are there, they just haven't connected. Mm -hmm. Or as you've said in the past, Catherine, haven't connected the dots. Yes. <laughs> together. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, great stuff. I can't wait for us to jump into everyone else's questions. And um, the first question we have is this. Um, how do you talk to people about the necessity of systematic versus personal change? And what suggestions do you provide to people getting interested in getting, or people interested in getting involved in pushing for systematic change? Um, I'll, I'll actually start on that. Um, and it's really interesting to me because, so I'm a scientist, right? We were both scientists. And when I first started talking to people about climate change, I would talk about the science. I would talk about the impacts, how it matters to us, how it's affecting things like flooding in our homes or extreme heat in the summer or the levels of the Great Lakes or how often we get heat waves. And then I noticed all the questions I was getting were questions about, so what are we supposed to do about it? 
And there I was, I was a little stymied because I'm like, well, we diagnose the problem. We tell you what the problem is, but we don't tell you how to fix it. That's not what we do. And it's true. It's not what we do. But here's the thing. If you're the only person talking to somebody, you better have at least some suggestion of what to do. Because otherwise, if we tell somebody there's a problem and we don't tell them what to do about it, what's our instinctive response as a human to say, oh, well, too bad. So sorry. Sounds horrible. And then you go, your, you know, go on your way because there's nothing we can do, right? There's no point to worrying about something that we can't affect. In fact, it's actually unhealthy to worry about something if we can't, literally can't do anything about it. But with climate change, we can't. So I thought to myself, I thought, okay, I know people always say, change your light bulbs, recycle, eat less meat, but you know what? Everybody's life is different. So I think the best thing to do if you want to reduce your personal carbon footprint is step on a carbon calculator, a carbon scale, because the biggest part of your footprint might not be the same as your neighbor's. It might be the house you live in. It might be your daily commute to work. In my case, it was flying. So I stepped on the carbon scales myself. I said, oh, wow, the biggest part of my footprint is flying. What am I going to do to reduce it? So pre-COVID, I had already transitioned over 80% of my talks to virtual talks. I only travel now when I bundle multiple events in the same place, anywhere from five up to 30, depending on how far away I have to fly. I was in the middle of one of these bundles in Ireland when the pandemic hit back in March. My last normal day was in um, uh, Belfast. And that night was when everything came crashing down. But the more I learned about climate change solutions, the more I realized that individual choices are not going to hack it. Even if everyone in the United States did everything they could, and the chances of everybody doing everything they could are slim, that would only be about 35 or 40% of the solution. And I'm talking everything. I'm not talking just you know electric car and solar panels. And then just recently, like last year, I found out something that should not have surprised me but it did. And this is what I learned. I learned that the concept of an ecological footprint, the idea of how much, how many resources we take up and the fact that to support your and my lifestyle living in a rich country, we would probably need four or five planets if everybody lived the same way. That that concept was created by um, a sustainability advocate and a planning and land use professor in Canada, the ecological footprint. And the carbon footprint is part of that, but their whole point was more like we are outliving the resources of our planet. So how did carbon footprint, how did personal carbon footprint become so popular? It was popularized in a British petroleum ad campaign 15 years ago. Yeah, you just rolled your eyes and I'm like, yes. Why? This, is, this is what I always say. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you yeah, off. No, but absolutely. I mean, that's the, that is it. They, they, the idea has always been if they can put the blame of this problem on the individual, make us feel helpless, make us feel uh, sort of destitute, then they've won, right? They've succeeded in kind of the big con. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, you are absolutely right, yes. So, so there is some scientific data that I think is very illuminating. And one piece of scientific data, and I'll drop the link in the chat here after I'm done talking, is um, Richard Heed looked at all the big oil, gas, and coal companies, and he found out that 90 corporations had produced two-thirds of all heat-trapping gas emissions since the dawn of the industrial era. And if you correlate that list with the list of Wikipedia's richest companies in the world, eight out of 10 of the richest companies in the world made their money digging up, processing, selling, or making things that burn fossil fuels. And BP is one of the companies on the top 10 of both of those lists. And Shell, where the CEO last summer gave a talk to a bunch of investors in London, Shell is also on that list. He said, the problem is, as I always tell my daughters, don't buy so many clothes. Or those people who eat strawberries out of season. And I'm like, you're one of the biggest, richest companies in the world that has produced the most carbon dioxide. I'm going to dump the links in the chat in a minute, so don't worry. I just can't do it while I'm talking. I, but I see the request coming in. So, so, do, so then people say, okay, well, so then does that mean that my personal actions don't matter? Of course we're not saying that because systems are made up of what? People. We do make a difference, but the biggest difference we can make, as I say in my TED Talk, is to use our voice to advocate for change, to talk about why it matters, to talk about what we're doing personally. 
I love talking about my solar panels and my plug-in car and the fact that I've reduced my food waste because that's a huge part of our footprint too is food waste. Not just eating meat, but what we don't eat is a huge part of it too. But talking about it is the most important thing that we can do and advocating for change at every level, at our school, at our university, at our institution, our organization, at our business, at the level of our city, of our state, at the federal level. And I wanna close with one little story to make my point. And the story is this. So about four or five years ago, there was a young girl, 13 years old, who was really worried and anxious and concerned about climate change as so many of our young people are. So she convinced her family to stop flying. She convinced her family to change their diet. She convinced her family to live the lowest carbon lifestyle they could afford and they could logically do where they lived. And if that's all she'd done, we would never know anything about her. But she did one more thing. She took a piece of white cardboard and she painted a few words on it. And those words were school strike for climate. And she went and she sat outside a building, which happened to be the Swedish parliament. And because of that one additional action of using her voice, everybody knows her name and her name is Greta. And she has inspired millions of people around the world because she used her voice. And I'll just add to that, because that's perfect. That's great. I think I always stress to my students the, the need to understand and, and advocate for systemic change over the burden of individual responsibility. And I always kind of end my course by telling my students that um, this isn't really a time to despair. Um, there is a lot you can do, even if if it if it's not an individual choice of like, I'm a vegetarian or I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, not drive or whatever. Um, <clears throat> we live in a moment um, where we can be truly revolutionary. We actually can, we, this is our, this is the moment in which we can, we can do that. And um, I think that, you know, using our voice, protesting, um, you know, all of these things that we can do collectively um, do make a big difference. Um, a collective action is always the thing that moves the needle in the direction of change. Um, so individually, um, I wouldn't, I, I tell my students not to be burdened by the, the responsibility of, of their individual actions, but, but to, to organize, get their, you know, um, start a community garden, um, get, talk to your neighbors about climate change, talk to them about things that you can do, um, publish a zine. I'm, I'm, I, I wrote an article uh, or a piece for a zine that my friend is publishing about why we should fly less to conferences, right? There are lots of things or maybe just have less, uh, you know, in-person conferences. Um, there are lots of things that we can do with our voice, like Catherine said, that make a much bigger difference than some of our individual actions. Not to say that you shouldn't do things individually. And I'll just close, I, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to find the study because it's been so long, but I always, I always reference it that at this point it's become myth. But there was a study that I read a long time ago, and maybe Catherine will know it. Um, since she's posting all of the links, which I'm so grateful for. Um, but it said that um, in one city where they studied the switch from plastic bags to canvas bags, that the use of plastic in the city actually went up because people had kind of absolved the sin of using a plastic bag, they're using a canvas bag. So they don't think about the other stuff that they're doing that might also be using plastic, um, for example. And so I think sometimes like when we do individual actions, we, we say, okay, that's good. That's enough. I've done it. I've done my part. Um, and, and so that also is kind of, can become uh, a problem if we're trying to actually push for this systemic change through collective action. You know, sometimes, sometimes the individual action of, you know, plastic recycling right now, you know, sometimes it's, it's easy for all of us to take this action that we believe is will make a difference, but that we have to dig deeper to see, is this, is what, it's, it's always more complicated. It's always more complicated, but that's another subject. And I don't wanna take us off track. I will take us to another question that is popular with people who are um, in this conversation today. And it's about uh, the actual conversation. We're getting back to actual talking about climate change and the, if you have identified any trigger or buzzwords to avoid when speaking to general audiences about climate change. I know, Catherine, you, you've had some observations about words strung together, um, which seems like it might fit into that, but why don't you start with that? Um, sure. So 
That's, I love that question. I saw that one. I was like, oh, yes, pick that question. Uh, so for many people, there are absolutely trigger words and they can come in all in, a, 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 you know, at, at all points in the spectrum. So for example, a colleague shared with me a while ago that she couldn't say climate change in her classroom because she had a student who would have a panic attack when she heard those two words. And I have found that when I say global warming, especially, but also sometimes when I say climate change around people who are dismissive of it or who reject it, that immediately they just turn off, they shut off. And um, neuroscientist Tally Sherratt was the person who I quoted last night. I'll drop a link to her book in the chat. It's a great book called The Influential Mind. She says that when we hear information we don't agree with in this information overload era, our brain literally turns off. So what the trigger words do is they induce a reaction in the person we're talking with that is the opposite of what we wanted. Instead of listening to us, they are either panicking, so they're not listening, or they're just, they view it as a threat, and so they just completely shut off. So how do we get around that? We get around that by not using those words. And this relates to a couple of the other questions I said, you know, how do you, they, one question was, how do you talk to people who aren't on board with this? You don't talk about climate change. You talk about how you both love fill in the blank. You both love birds. You both love your city of Chicago or wherever you live. You both love your kids. You both belong to the Rotary Club. You both share the same faith. You both have an interest in art. And in my TED Talk, I give more examples like that, but it isn't about talking about climate change per se. The only reason it matters is because it affects everything we already care about today. So begin the conversation with that. What about you, Mika? What are some buzzwords that you've heard that kind of turn people off? Yeah, I mean, global warming is a big is a big buzzword. Um, but but just in general, I think um, one you know uh, point of resistance that I've found, especially here in, in the Midwest, um, is is talking to people about like f for some reason. Um, diet and consumption of meat and all of this consumption of meat is really triggering to a lot of people when you talk to them about that. They, they, it's, we've been, and there are a lot of reasons for this, we've been led down this road where we consume more meat per capita in the U.S. than most other countries in the world, even countries that you think of that consume a lot of meat. Uh, we consume a lot of meat. A lot of that has to do with, um, you know, um, big agriculture and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's, um, influence on politics and political solutions and various there are various reasons why we consume a lot of meat but i find that you know a lot of people even people who are really receptive to to climate change and solutions to the climate crisis um when you bring up diet and when you bring up meat consumption in particular um it's almost like dismissed it's something that's that's not worth talking about all these other things we can talk about but we can't talk about that so um, that's tricky for me. I'm a vegetarian. I, I made that decision partly because it made me feel better about being a climate scientist. Um, and I, and I, that's another um, point going back to what Catherine was talking about, individual responsibility versus collective systemic action. Um, I also advocate always for doing things individually if it makes you feel better. Um, maybe it's a virtue signal, maybe it's a performance. That's okay too if it's the, if it's the sort of right thing to do, right? Like I, I became vegetarian. I know that's not going to solve the climate crisis, but it makes me feel a little bit better about my role in it. And so I think if that's, if that's something that you want to do, I say go for it, right? Like to, there's nothing wrong with that if it makes you feel better and that's the only reason you want to do it. So yeah, I mean, I think diet is really one that's like, complicated. I think animal agriculture in this country is, is kind of like a taboo subject that we can't really touch. We love our McDonald's hamburgers, you know? So maybe, maybe we have to find, find something else that, that is a commonality between ourselves and the people that we're talking to. <laughs> maybe we avoid the, the diet thing. Uh, we have, all right, we have time for one more question. So, so, well, I'm not even sure that we should. Um, I think we'll have to, I think we'll have well, we to. Well, we can commit to doing short answers, right, Mika? We can each give like a super short answer. So let's do like quick speed round. Yeah, quick yes. speed round. Speed round. Yes. How can we effectively fight pride without pushing the other person farther away? A big part of climate com uh, communicating climate change is talking to people who don't believe. If they've already dug that hole for themselves, it will take a lot for folks to set aside their pride and say, I was wrong. How to share without alienating? 
Well, I have a quick answer to that, and that is my TED Talk. That is exactly what my TED Talk is about. And you begin the conversation with something you agree with them on. You end the conversation with a solution that they can be proud of that makes them a more genuine version of who they already are. That's the way to do it. Okay, next question. Oh, oh, oh. And Mika, anything on that? Um, no, no, but I'm, I'm reading through the questions myself, sorry, and I can answer a few of them that people have asked. Go for it. Uh, someone asked if I have a reading list. I can share my reading list on my Twitter, my, um, which um, you can find me on Twitter. It's like Dr. Mika. Um, just Google for that. I can't remember what my handle is. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, someone else said, I have heard that often that facts and data are not useful in convincing others. Um, oh, shoot, it just disappeared what would you say to this? And, I, and my answer, of course, would be that we have to tap into other imagination another way, perhaps mm -hmm. using art or music or sound or experience. Um, okay, Catherine, how about this? How do we discuss climate change without focusing on the overwhelming truth that climate change is an inevitable, irreversible reality? My focus is on those who understand the data but may feel hopeless. Absolutely. So I have two global weirding episodes, and I'll drop the link in the chat right here. One of them says, should we just scare the pants off people to make them change? And the answer to that is no. And I explain the psychology why hope is so important, because without hope will be a self-fulfilling prophecy of despair. If we don't have hope, even as a scientist, I would just say, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. If the asteroid's coming and you can't stop it, <laughs> why worry about it? But we can. I know for a fact, because of my work, that we can make a difference. Our choices do matter. And so knowing that difference and using our art and our creativity to envision a better future is incredibly important. So check out Global Weirding. There's one video called, Is It Too Late? And there's another, another video called, Should We Just Tell People It's Really Scary? Yeah, and on the, on the is it too late, I, I always say, um, you know, we hear these things like catastrophic climate change at two degrees of warming. Well, 2.1 is better than 2.2, which is better than 2.3. So it doesn't mean you just stop at two degrees, right? You, there's always the, when the, like, don't despair. Whatever we do is going to be better than whatever we didn't do, right? So, so uh, if we go over that two degree threshold, 2.1 is better than three. Um, and so I think that's important to keep in mind. Like there's, it doesn't just, there's not this one point at which that's it, that's it. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. Well, let's, how about a, a parting thought from each of you, uh, 30 seconds each. Uh, Mika, why don't you start? <laughs> oh my God, 30 seconds. <laughs> well, I think, I think continuing on this theme, I mean, the, the talk that I give a lot is titled Reimagining Futures. I think, um, part of, of forging a path forward to solutions to the climate crisis is using our imaginations, using our imaginations to imagine a future um, that is equitable, that solves the climate crisis, that creates and sustains a habitable planet. But if we don't imagine it first, then we won't have it. Um, and so I always draw on um, like books by Octavia Butler and other Afrofuturists who kind of started imagining this future for us already, actually. Um, and so I highly recommend if you're into like fictional novels, reading some of those because they think about how we can imagine a future that's better for all of us, even in sort of the, the ruins, if you will, of, of kind of the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. I love that. When it all comes down to it, all of this is driven by fear whether it's our panic and anxiety and our despair, or whether it's our rejection of the science. It doesn't come from any genuine skepticism of 150 year old physics. It comes from fear. And so that is why engaging from the heart rather than the head is so important. And art has a way of immediately bypassing the head and going straight to the heart, even though it's very much informed by the head, as Mika pointed out. Artists are very thoughtful and careful about what they're doing, but it reaches us in a different place. And we can do that through our conversations too. We can do that in the way that we engage with people, but we have to be conscious of that because too often, again, data is the weapon that we use to judge, stereotype, and dismiss each other in today's world. And by looking past that to our genuine fears and our genuine hopes, which we as humans share all across the whole planet, the pandemic has taught us that, that we are all the same when it comes down to it. By beginning the conversation at that level, we can focus more on what unites us rather than what divides us. Oh, what a perfect note to end on. Oh my goodness. Thank you both to our amazing conversationalists, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, Catherine Hayhoe and Mika Tosca. 
before we go, if you're all excited about more programs like this, I'll give a quick rundown of what we have coming with Third Coast Disrupted programming. On October 1st, we have Water, Water Everywhere, First Person Flooding Impact and Action. October 8th, Avian Effects, Climate Change and Birds. And our last program, October 22nd, is Getting Around Carbon, New Looks at Transportation Options, <coughs> excuse me, which is sponsored by the Illinois Science and Energy Innovation Foundation. All of these are panels, and on each panel is an artist and a scientist. You can learn more about our programs and the exhibition at thirdcoastdisrupted.org and column, C-O-L-U-M dot E-D-U slash third coast. Thank you again to our panelists. Thank you all for participating and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you okay. so much.